Good morning, good noon, good afternoon, good evening, good night. It's your Lena here again, bringing you the new episode of Opera Wears. So that was the overture for Verdi's Love, Rosa de Destino, which again you can see from the title and the cover, the theme or the opera we're going to review today. But again, before everything, sorry for the being really late. First. I spent some time thinking about how can can I do my second episode on Romeo and Juliet to revise on some mistakes I made, and the last week was also really packed. I performed for school's musical, catch up to class Carnegie Hall review through radio, and went to some random performance with all of the high school chorus and the orchestra with literally ten people at a stern auditorium. At Carnegie Hall on Sunday, and also this Monday, I invited an opera singer from Romeo and Juliet, Federico Valentine, which I did mention from my last episode, to come to our school to do a Q and A section with of the kids in my opera club. That was a great experience. I need to say that the only reason why La Fosa di Dastiano is somehow attractive to me is because my friends, yes, is plural, multiple friends, kept repeating how good Lisa Davidson was, and one of them even went to La Fosa di Dastiano four times, even though she disliked the staging and the new production aspect, but. She did all of that only for Davidson. Oh, one thing that is really sad is Davidson only performed for like three weeks, and I do have all of this and that to do. And on Thursday, I suddenly realized, oh, if you keep yourself busy, then you'll have infinite amount of things to do. So even though Davidson is away. But considering the fact that there are only four performances left, I actually skipped schoolwork in order to see the opera. So now we're here with the new production of Verdi's La Fosa de Dastino. The opening for this opera is at February twenty ninth. Yeah, this year is our favorite leap year when actual. Day to work, yay! So as you can see from that, the main opera is actually trying to emphasize the importance of this new production, and I was also looking forward to this old classical opera by Verdi because, in certain aspect, I love it. I love Verdi. I'm not trying to say two contradictory things, but being attractive and looking forward are two whole different concepts and words. Attractive means something that makes me desire of, and looking forward means a moderate amount of general expectation. To me, even though they always do that, but it is. It's kind of interesting to see that they choose La Fosa de Dastino for this season. The overall conclusion of this new production is: it is not as bad as Carmen, but still not something that I wouldn't appreciate too much of. Before I went to any reviews on this opera, back to our nice little introductory part. Premiered in 1862 by Verdi, La Fosa del Destino is based on Andrew de Salvador's Don Avalo on la Fosa del Destino of 1835. It is actually a Spanish play. Angel de Salvador is an iconic figure for the Spanish Romanticism movement in the 19th century. For the name of the opera, Verdi. Took the second half of of it and translated from Espanol into Italiano, changed the plot a little bit, but still kept on Avalo one of the main characters and also some parts of the plot. 
talking about translating Spanish into Italian, one of my f- Italian friend once said that,、uh, uh, even though Spanish and Italian is two different languages, but they share some common aspect. So even though she doesn't speak Spanish at all, but she can still like kind of understand Spanish and negotiate with Spanish Spanish people. And I found that really cool. There's a lot of name involved. I try to make the story of the opera as clear as possible. La Fosa de Dalciano is basically about Don Alvaro and Leonora are in love, but they are discovered by Leonora's father, and Alvaro accidentally killed Leonora's father. Leonora and Alvaro were separated, and Leonora tried to seek refuge at the monastery. Alvaro believing Leonora that joins the army, Alvaro's true identity is revealed, leading to a confrontation with Leonora's brother Carlo. Carlo, Carlo and Alvaro fight to fight each other near Leonora's hermitage. Alvaro when Leonora appeared and she was killed after Leonora's death, Alvaro tried to seek redemption. That's probably all. The performance history is something that interested me. As always, there are revisions that was made seven years after the premiere, which is 1869 by some simple calculation. Verdi made the largest change in this revision, an overture replaced the prelude, and also the last scene of the opera was added. As you can see, I played the overture. In the beginning of this podcast, by the way, that's Carolyn and Berlin for harmonics version. Compared to the old version, where Alvaro jumps into the nearby ravine, the new version was two scenes in the fourth act leave the audience somewhat a happy ending, even though everyone died. But like, okay, they excuse each other, and Alvaro gets back to. God and being written. Now, going back to the review section for this new mass production, the first point is very obviously the pace. Matt combines acts one and two together, makes it eighty-five minutes without any intermission, but two brief pauses. That's probably one or two minutes, and unfortunately, I drink like two venti-sized Starbucks coffee before the opera. Don't ask why, because they have the buy one get one free, and I don't have any friends who go to opera with me, so I was forced to drink two. And I was like, ah, I need to go to the bathroom, but it is eighty-five minutes, and I try to control myself. As hard as possible, and that's really painful. And it is one and half hour. I don't. I just don't understand why. Because apparently, you're not going to let your audience focus for the whole one and half hour. And I think they at least need to insert a five minute brief pause instead of the two minute ones. And that was really annoys me. And for the production, I was reading some poses, and the first three words on it is a contemporary city, and it literally revealed everything. And my expectation for this immediately went down into the Pacific Ocean. I was trying to figure out a way to like change how the review section can goes. Oh, so now I'm going to talk. From act to act, instead of reviewing on a specific thing to try to make it as clear as possible, so feel free to jump around if you're interested in any specific thing. So the first act is kind of comfort my panic for new production and the contemporary background a little bit. The staging is relatively absorbing. They have the rotating stage sets of um, but this time it is an interesting one. I do want to say the connection between different parts of the rotating 
set of design is pretty smart. They put up doors, and the singers is running between different sections of the stage while it is moving. They did give a sense of motion along with the correct mood. However, since it is a company with that seven minute overture, I have some really serious disappointment towards Yannick's conducting. I already have that kind of expectation of, oh, I'm not going to trust to let、like, Yannick do all of this alone, and there will definitely be some problem. But today, it is at that level that makes me considering the question: Should I have left five seconds after the overture started? Imagine Yannick being on Yannick. The origin of this opera is quite famous and is Verdi's masterpiece, although it is called an overture. But it is closer to a prelude since it is supposed to be a prelude in the original version, and its performance is usually not before the opening, but often after the first scene of the first act. And that's another place where my opera change for this new production. They move the overture before anyone starts singing. The piece should begin with a powerful horn-like fanfare of the brass instrument, suggesting the irreversibility power of fate. What's problematic about Yannick's conducting on Thursday is that there is literally no density and any management of tempo. I don't see any power of fate, but rather free-floating notes. What the hell am I getting out of here? And、uh, Leonora, or should I say, Elaine Stokino, starts singing. I kind of recognize her because she's in the main role of three operas this season. The other two were La Boheme and Un Bolo in Maschera. She played Mimi and Amelia. Both are leading main characters, but I mean, Davison is. How can I describe it? The main Leonora, so you can actually feel the differences between them, just by the single aria "Mi Balagena" and "Olfena" in the first act. By the way, please listen to Kala's version. It is really impressive, and you, I use it as reference. And the second act. Well, it is when I begin to question myself: Why did I live before? They start the second act with projecting some random video of helicopter and fire along the sound effect they made. And after that mysterical woman, Prezosia and her people appears. That's a really interesting thing, but now I have to re- be very honest and say I see no charisma, but rather a bunch of street prostitutes. I'm really sorry for saying that, but at least my baseline for a character like this is you have to be at least at the level of Carmen from the new production of Carmen. There's no mystery with. In this figure, along with her presentation that I can see from this new production, they look just really cheap in a way, and I genuinely don't understand why they have a bunch of Burning Moon video on a LED screen as background while people with rabbit hats are dancing. And honestly, that looks so much like the Apple's default moon wallpaper. Apple better sue them. And after all of this and that happened in the military, we are back to Leonora, who went wants to seek refuge at a monastery, while the rotating stage is back. Wow, W O W. Um, that's back to the two sides front and back style. I'm just thinking if the definition of new production is to have rotating stage and projector with a new setting that doesn't fit the plot properly. I mean, they use the similar stage design in all of the new productions, including Dama Walking, Carmen, 
and they use rotating stage in the repertory work Nabucco and right here. Mad Opera is a very interesting company, I have to say. Well, however, Elena Sakina, her voice is kind of kind of back. Her singing in the second act is way more better than was in the first act. It is brighter and projects better. Now moving on to the third act, they have the rotating stage again. Now I'm tired for that. Oh,、uh, how does this role function without rotating stage and projectors? Please take that as a sarcastic. We have Fuzzillo again. I just realized I forgot to mention, but the singer for Fuzzillo is Maria Vorkova. Which is another Russian singer. If you know or you don't know, Elena Stakina is also from Russia. Varkova also sings Fenia in Nabucco. As what I said in my Nabucco episode, my favorite figure from Nabucco is Fenia, and I like to see her again here. Even though Stakina and Varkova are both Russian, and I consider them both use the Russian school singing style instead of Italian school style, but Stakina is soprano and Varkova is mezzo soprano. I love Russian mezzos. For example, a eagle machina from Carmen. By the way, her twenty-four to twenty-five schedule is also full with Carmen. Oh gosh, you know I feel like a machina for Carmen is like like for for a queen of the night. I think I'm going too out of topic right now. Please take it as a usual thing within this podcast. The thing good about Barakova is she knows how to put emotions into the arias, and that's really fascinating and attractive to me as an audience. Well, there are definitely a reason why I mention Ag Machina and Carmen because I think all the props for Act Three came from Carmen. Surprisingly enough, I found the wall they use for Act Four of Carmen similar to the wall of the camp here. And besides Maria Vovacova for a Brazilian, Brian Jado for a Varro and Ignore Golovatenko for Carlos' wonderful singing, the chorus are kind of off a little bit. The lines are blurry and they're not that together. They need more practice, definitely. Ah,、uh, and an interesting thing is that the Mad Opera choose to. Film a video about how the men's chorus practice as well as their advertisement on Instagram. Wow, they're so brave. Along with the average presentation of the chorus, Yannick's conducting is still unsatisfied with rushing and overly emphasizing the existence of the orchestra. I don't know why he forced the orchestra in such a hurry. And the fourth, also the last act. I do want to quote directly from the synopsis again. The the war is over. The world is still on the verge of a paralysis. I don't know where that British accent came from, but okay. All of this and that fancy words with no actual contribution and meaning, while、well, sounds so much like my English language art essay, and so do the stage. The setting is a bunch of refugees in a subway station, and guess what? That's New York right now with all of the homelesses and refugees sleeping on the subway with the government doing absolutely nothing. So ironic, haha. <laughs> to be honest, that subway station looks familiar to me. Yes, I'm referring to Jackson Heights Roosevelt Avenue train station. And to be honest, again, this is the best act despite the random subway station setting. The orchestras and the singers are all on points and bring nice harmony to the audience, bringing us the soft but heartbroken resolution for everything. Actually, for me, it is not that heartbreaking because even though everyone died, but like they excuse each other, and I believe if it. If they have a second life, they'll definitely be happy together. Well, that's my review on all of the four acts. The most general conclusion I can make: 
referring back to what I said before, is that I never trust those new production membranes and Yonex conducting style. Singers are great, Verdi's composition is great, everything else. Well, I believe you can make a fair comment on it after watching it or finish listening to the podcast. There are only two performances left for La Cosa de Dastino, but you can watch it anytime if you have met opera in HD. Thank you for listening to this podcast. The next episode will be some additional thoughts on Romeo and Juliet since I went to watch it again because, you know, live performances are very subjective and different from days to days. But it should be a brief episode that's under 10 minutes, probably around 5 minutes. And as always, if you have any question, comment, opinions on what I said, or you just want to talk to me, feel free to email me at olandatown.com. It is A-U-L-I-N-D-A-T-A-N-G at gmail.com. Thank you so much for listening. See you in my next episode. Yay. I actually have absolutely no idea about how can I draw a cover for this. Maybe I'll try. You know, sometimes I'm just out of creative creative ideas. Okay. But bye. See you in my next episode. Have a nice day.